Hello, my name is Jeff, and this is my take on Stephanie Lynn Nix. Welcome, everybody. Being a fan of Stevie Nicks and Fleetwood Mac is trendy these days. I mean, for God's sake, Harry Styles is all about them. But I feel I need to inform you of something, something very important. And that is that I, Jeff, have been into Stevie Nicks and Fleetwood Mac for 23 years. That is since 1997, when Harry Styles was just a super hot three-year-old. In 1997, Fleetwood Mac reunited for a live concert and album called The Dance, which was all over the telly at the time, and also used in every electronic store to showcase a new media format called Digital Video Disc. And I, a savvy music fan far beyond my 16 years, was all over that reunion program, right on top of that shit. All right, that's not exactly true. The fact is I flipped by it many times that year while channel surfing, had no idea what it was, saw two older blonde ladies singing, assumed they must be Heart, and switched back to General Hospital or Saved by the Bell. I watched a lot of TV in those days, especially General Hospital and Saved by the Bell. But day after day, I kept flipping by this Heart concert. It was everywhere, I couldn't escape it. It seemed to be playing on loop on MTV, on Video Hits 1, and on the PBS. So one day I thought, eh, just leave it here for a second, see what this boomer extravaganza is all about. So I put down the remote and watched. And then I witnessed this. And this. And this. burgeoning young gay in me, too sophisticated to be obsessed by Madonna, too young to be existentially invested in Barbara or Cher, too, I don't know, mayonnaise to be overly taken with Whitney or Mariah, had found the one. It was her. It was this ethereal woman in her late 40s with long blonde hair and flowing black chiffon twirling around in shawls and singing about dreams and chains and gypsies and gold dust. Her voice was unusual, husky, mature, captivating. It was a voice that was lived in, that had been around the block. Who was this woman? Oh, that's the Stevie Nicks I've always heard about? And who's this dude on guitar she keeps ominously staring down? Apparently his name is Lindsay. Lindsay Buckingham! The girl had a boy's name and the boy had a girl's name. How neat! It was good, catchy, light rock music, folky, acoustic electric -y with a bit of an edge, played by genuinely talented musicians and incorporating just the right amount of theater. Next time it was on, I watched it again, from start to finish, and then again, and then again, and then again, and then again. <laughs> And then I made my sister watch it, and my parents. I bought the CD and all the CDs, and all the solo work from both Stevie and Lindsay. I love Christine too. She's key. She's vital to the equation. My sister, Anne, 18 at the time, saw what was happening to me and resisted at first, because up until then, Dave Matthews had been our band. We were Dave heads, and our most transcendent live musical experiences had been at Dave concerts during meandering Leroy Moore saxophone solos. But her resistance was futile. She soon gave in and accepted that we were now Polly. And the dance became a staple in the car and everywhere else. We were all in. I learned to Fleetwood Mac's dramatic history. I watched the behind the music. I utilized a web crawler to execute internet searches on the family compact where all kinds of information was available. I learned they had been broken up for years and this had been a triumphant comeback. 1997 marked 20 years since the 1977 release of Rumors, Fleetwood Mac's monster smash breakup album which sat at number one for a gazillion weeks and launched them into the popular stratosphere, making Fleetwood Mac fandom Trendy. Rumors was actually the band's 10th album and the second to include new members Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham. Many people forget it was the previous so-called White album that featured Landslide, Rhiannon, Say You Love Me, Monday Morning, and more. 
but rumors with dreams, secondhand news, gold dust woman, never going back again, go your own way, you make love and fun, oh daddy, the chain, I don't want to know, songbird, and don't stop, thinking about tomorrow, put them over the top. Incestual love affairs and breakups and drug addictions ensued until the 80s were over and so was the band. Former lovers Stevie and Lindsay were just too mad at each other. It was untenable, you guys. But now, this glorious reunion, the dance. And it included Silver Springs, which didn't make it on rumors because there wasn't enough room because of the limitations of analog. So instead got released as a B-side to the Go Your Own Way single, but it really should have been on the album because it's a great old song. Silver Springs is a great old song, thank you. It's a great old song, Lindsay. But wait. 16-year-old Jeff discovered the dance was not just a concert album, but a tour, and are you kidding me? They had already been in my area. Only weeks before my enlightenment, they played the Shoreline Amphitheater in Mountain View, where my sister and I had taken in many a saxophone solo. F me. I missed them. Why, oh why, hadn't I stopped and watched this months ago when they were heart? This was unacceptable. I had to experience them live. The following year, 1998, in the year of our Lord, Stevie put out a three-disc box set called Enchanted and toured solo. By then, my sister and I were complete devotees. Anne had begun to incorporate Stevie-esque touches into her fashion repertoire, and we attended the show in full garb. She completely Stevied out in a white witchy dress and purple suede boots, and myself dressed as Mick Fleetwood with a puffy white shirt, black vest with a gold chain, and balls hanging from my balls. We had fifth row center seats and were the youngest and best looking people there by a mile. My sister turned many heads, mostly lesbian. Now. I knew going in that there was a tradition at Stevie's shows, a sacred ritual, if you will, called the Stevie Walk. Nick's heads knew that toward the end of the show, Edge of Seventeen was the cue for the front rows to rush the stage and prostrate themselves as Stevie walked the line, shaking hands, healing the infirm, and receiving gifts, offerings, and sacrifices from her disciples. Well, I was determined to participate. I was determined to be healed. Sure enough, when that electric guitar riff started, the crowd stirred, a collective consciousness awakened, and we bolted for the stage. I got a good spot, center left. And Anne stayed back so she could capture the moment on the disposable camera we had smuggled in by stuffing it in the taint area of my underwear. Back then there were no cameras allowed in concerts. Security would actually scold you. You had to be covert. Smartphones were still 10 years away. Anyway, the white winged doves were sung. <laughs> The ooh, baby, ooh, sad oohs were accomplished. And as the long musical outro commenced, Stevie began her walk. She started stage right on purpose so that I would enjoy the maximum anticipation. I'm certain she had me in mind when she made this choice. I watched as she made her way past the less important fans and toward me. I positioned myself courteously so she didn't have to strain and her large African bodyguard didn't have to let go of her hips. Finally, she arrived at my precise latitude and longitude. The same spot I occupied in time space. She took both my hands in hers and looked me directly in the eyes, smiling big, and I managed to produce out of my mouth Thank you, Stevie. <laughs> Thank you, Stevie. Thank you, Stevie. As her divine energy transferred into my body, I distinctly remember noticing age lines on her face and in her cleavage and realizing she was in fact a human person. Moments later, as she performed Landslide, I took my love and I took it down. The woman standing next to me began to weep, looking over at me and confiding, I can't believe she's standing right in front of me singing this. And I saw my reflection in the snow-covered hill. The landslide brought me down. I know. 
I went. Because I did know. I completely understood what this random middle-aged woman was feeling in that moment, being roughly Stevie's age and probably a fan half her life, with Stevie's music a large part of her own life's soundtrack as she grew up and older, experiencing love and loss and contemplating her mortality and what it all means. And now, Stevie was feet from her, singing her bittersweet anthem about time making you bolder and children getting older. Can I sail through? No doubt this woman was having a profound, full circle moment. Just like I was. Just like I, a teenage boy who had been a fan since the previous September, was experiencing. Once again, completely in on it. Completely in on the whole thing. The following year, at the end of 1999, Stevie announced an intimate New Year's concert called Pondering the Millennium at the House of Blues in Los Angeles. It was 21 and over, so Anne and I and another friend secured fake IDs. Making the 300 mile drive from Santa Cruz and gambling on the IDs getting us through the door. On the drive down, while the three of us sang and goofed off, our friend lost control of the car and we spun out on the freeway. Rolled over slid windshield first into the embankment glass shattering and dirt and rocks pouring in When we came to a stop, after realizing I was alive, my first thought was that the car would burst into flames like it always did on General Hospital and Saved by the Bell, so I frantically unlocked my seatbelt and scrambled out the broken window. Once out and standing, I had a terrifying moment. Everything was quiet, there was no sound coming out of the car, and I knew I had to bend down and look in to see if Anne and our friend were okay. I thought to myself, they might be dead. Anne might be dead. I have to look inside and see. And I have to do it now before the car bursts into flames. Well, they were scraped up and rattled as I was, but they were alive as I was. God had spared us so that we might ring in the new millennium with a pagan. We had to spend the night in Paso Robles and deal with insurance and whatnot, call our parents tell them what happened. My mom cried on the phone, as I recall. The car was totaled, but we did not abort our trip. We got a rental and carried on. I came away with the distinct feeling that we had lucked out, dodged a bullet. It could have been very different. I could have looked into that car and seen something horrific. I probably wouldn't be able to walk away from another car accident that bad in my life. That was my one freebie. So I better be very careful going forward. And I mostly have. I only sometimes drive with my knees. Anyway, the fake IDs work like a charm. Can you imagine if they hadn't? Another up close and personal Stevie show, dressed to the nines in our pseudo goth garb. Thank you. Anne and I saw Stevie yet again in 2001 when she put out a new album, Trouble and Shangri La, again at the shoreline. Our seats were about halfway back this time, too far to participate in the Stevie walk. We decided to forego the costumes and dress like normal white people. I remember we drove away that night feeling a little let down. We discussed how we wished Stevie had twirled more. She wasn't hamming it up enough. She wasn't giving us enough red meat. Oh well, it was fine. In 2003, 
Fleetwood Mac got together again, albeit without Christine McVie, who had retired, for a new album and tour called Say You Will. We would miss Christine's songs, but here was our chance, six years after the dance, to see Stevie stare down Lindsay in person, with Mick on drums and John on bass, even if half of heart was missing. San Jose Arena. We had floor seats. We dressed up nice, but not like crazy people. I remember before the show, Anne saying she hadn't been that excited for a concert in a long time since some of the earlier Dave shows. And I felt the same way. We ate up every minute of it, even the new songs, especially the new songs. When less sophisticated fans sat down or went to the bathroom, we didn't. Not us. We were all over that shit. And Stevie delivered. She sufficiently twirled. She must have known. Also, they did Silver Springs, which is a great old song. Silver Springs is a great old song. Thank you. It's a great old song, Lindsay. Two years later, in 2005, Anne died. <laughs> At the age of 26, from melanoma. A bullet she, unfortunately, hadn't dodged. I don't want to leave you guys, she said. I don't want to miss everything. Stevie toured that year. I didn't go. A good friend helped me through that nightmare, and we ended up, through all that, falling in love. Which is weird, because we're both dudes. Another two years later, Stevie toured again, and I took that dude, whom I had, of course, turned into a fan. Concord Pavilion, decent seats. I got to rush the stage again at that show and do the Stevie walk. She touched my hands again. I don't remember what I said or if I said anything. We didn't take any pictures. Her voice was strong that night. In 2008, Leroy Moore died, the saxophonist from Dave Matthews' band after an ATV accident. Christ almighty. No more meandering solos. The dude moved to the East Coast and I moved to Los Angeles and after seven years together we returned to friendship. Years passed. By 2017, Christine McVie had come out of retirement and rejoined the band for another tour. And finally, I got to see them all together. The complete dance lineup at the Forum in LA, live and in person, with all band members present. 20 years after I first stopped on that channel. I went alone. I took a selfie outside with my iPhone. My seat was kind of high up in one of the side sections, but it was a good view and I was very excited. During landslide that night, the forum ceiling lit up with sparkling lights that looked like a galaxy of stars. It was one of the best renditions I'd heard Stevie do in a long time. And I thought about how strange it was that she was standing there in front of me, singing that song I'd heard a million times, and which had been a part of the soundtrack of my life. I've been afraid of changing cause I, I built my life around you. But The Weeping Lady from 1998 crossed my mind. I wondered where she was now, and if she ever stopped crying. Finally, I decided she probably kicked it a long time ago, perhaps a car accident. Then I snapped back to reality, and somehow they were in the middle of Go Your Own Way. Shortly after that, Stevie had Lindsay kicked out of the band. So dramatic, right? Won't those two ever work out their problems? And they toured again without him in 2018-2019. I skipped that one. <laughs> I let the forum be my last Fleetwood Mac experience. They're all in their 70s now. I'm about to turn 40. I've loved and lost. I've been around the block a few times. I've sailed through the changing ocean tides, and I'm facing a new season of my life. Eventually, inevitably, the landslide will bring it all down. Where?